So what we're going to do, we're going to do an investor investor discussion, famous investor discussion on uh, Charlie Munger. So I'm going to share my screen and, you know, I'm pretty excited about this because I, I think that Charlie Munger, I always kind of thought, you know, maybe he doesn't get the credit he deserves, even though he does get credit, he certainly gets it. But um, whenever you, you whenever you think of Berkshire Hathaway, it's always Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett's the greatest investor ever, certainly one of the richest men in the world. Um, you rarely ever hear about Charlie. And, you know, it's funny because when if you look at the at the AGM, the Berkshire Hathaway AGM, Charlie's really a man of a few words a lot of the times. Like he'll answer questions just very succinctly and, you know, a couple of words. Whereas Warren Buffett, he's the more charismatic one. He makes a lot of jokes, makes people laugh. Um, but I always thought, you know, maybe maybe Charles is is more the brains behind the operation than even a lot of people think. So I learned a few things about him, um, mostly positive. And, you know, you know, one thing at the end that I'll talk about that I disagree with what he said, but uh, let's just get into it. So a couple of, of quick facts uh, from him. Um, born in Omaha, ne Nebraska in, 20, in 1924. So he's 98 years old. Crazy, like that he's still going to work and he's still, you know, doing such a, a, a stand-up job at, at, at 98. Um, I mean, that's fantastic. Uh, estimated net worth of 2.1 billion. So, you know, less than Warren Buffett, who I think is upwards around like 60 billion. Uh, one of the things I didn't know about, about Charles Munger is that he's a World War II veteran. He served in the U.S. Army Air Corps from 1943 to 1946. He was a junior second lieutenant. Now, I didn't, couldn't find a lot of information about his actual service, um, if he if he was in combat or anything, but he he did serve during World War II. Um, graduated Harvard Law in 1948. Afterwards, he entered um, practice as a lawyer. He had his own practice. Um, he began investing with Warren Buffett. Uh, I believe it was around like 1965, 1967 range. But actually, him and Warren go way back because he worked as a teenager for I believe it was Warren Buffett's grandfather's company. So I'm sure that they knew each other even way back then. Buffett and Son, yeah. And um, currently vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway and known as Warren Buffett's right-hand man. And he, he came to this position in 1978. So one of the best ways, I think, to really understand an investor is to look at their portfolio. And this is Charlie Munger's personal portfolio. It's really not very exciting. Not at all. There's, there's four stocks in here. Costco, you hear a lot about him loving Costco. He talks about it all the time. He's a director for the company. It's a 90 million position. Um, but about 95% of his portfolio is in Berkshire Hathaway. About 1.9 billion of the 1.98. 1.88 billion of the 1.98. And he also owns a position in the Daily Journal, which from what I can tell, it's, it's basically acting right now as a holding company. So he manages the portfolio of the Daily Journal. Um, the investment portfolio, it's worth a little less than $200 million. And this is what that portfolio has. Once again, you know, nothing too exciting here. Um, five companies, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Alibaba, U.S. Bank Corp, Corp POSCO, a a ADR. So, um, you know, really not focused on a wide, casting a wide net, obviously. Now, if we look at the top five holdings of Berkshire Hathaway, so these are the top five holdings and the percentage that each of those companies accounts for um, um, of the invested capital. And Apple, 42% of the invested capital. So this is in publicly traded companies. Um, the entire portfolio, I believe, is around 450 billion or so. And it's uh, there's about 100 and 120 billion in cash or so um, as of the last reporting in June, in June 30th. So Apple, 42% of the stock portfolio, Bank of America, 10%. So the top five companies together um, account for 75% of the total invested portfolio. So obviously very focused investors. And this is really part of the comp of, of Munger's and Buffett's strategy. It's a big part of their strategy where they don't like, they don't like a lot of activity. They say like the less activity, the better. Don't be active just for the sake of being active. And they're talking, you know, to traders out there, to people that are constantly looking at the ups and downs in their portfolio and thinking, should I buy? Should I sell? Should I make changes? Um, just a quote from here, there, he says there's huge advantages for an individual um, to get into a position with just a few great investments and sit. Um, you're paying less to brokers, you're listening to less nonsense. If it works, the government awards you. And that's true. You Traders will generally pay more in taxes if they're making money. Um, he's saying the 1% to 3% percentage points compounded, which makes a big difference over time. So this is a key part 
of the strategy at Berkshire is to make a small number of bets and really focus your capital into the companies, a, a, a small collection of companies that um, that you believe um, really stand above the others. Make 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 those bets count. So Charlie Munger is he's very focused on learning. This is something that I heard from Warren Buffett too. These are guys that read all the time. One of the quotes here: "In my whole life, I've known no wise people over a broad subject matter area who didn't read all the time. Zero, none. You'd be amazed how much Warren and him read." says he gets laughed at by his children. He reads so much. And, you know, he's really focused. He talks a lot about, about having a wide range of knowledge, like being knowledgeable on a wide range of different things. And this is, this is something that is, of course, very important to, um, to a stock picker or an investment manager because you may be researching companies in a wide range of industries. You could be researching a manufacturing company one day, another day a technology company. So having having good knowledge in a, in a wide range of areas really helps you understand what these companies are doing, what the opportunities and what the risks are. Um, but one another thing that he really has talked a lot about is the use of mental models. So a mental model is really, it's, it's an explanation of how something works in the real world. And often it's used to um, predict the future um, or try and predict the future, try and have an understanding of what's going to happen based on the current situation and what's going on. And it's also mental models are also used to help you understand your own biases. So he's big on developing um, a collection of mental, mental models, um, mastering multiple mental models, which underlie the reality is the best thing you can do, essentially, he says. And he's, he's provided examples as well. So uh, mental models can be hard science or engineering, um, like for example, like the laws of physics, he talks about um, the engineering idea of a backup system as being a very powerful idea. The engineering idea of breaking points, um, the, the concept of critical mass. He's talked about Coca-Cola and Disney and how they, they were able to develop a critical mass in their, in their own business to become successful. And what he thinks people need to do is they need to develop these different types of mental models and they need to connect them together in a lattice work. And he calls it Lola Palooza. He says you, you get Lola Palooza effects when two, three, or four of these forces are all operating in the same direction. So you have these mental models on how the world works, how um, different companies and business models operate, and you connect them together in order to make good, wise decisions and intelligent investments. So mental models are not, it's not just about the laws of science, also simplicity is a main focus of his investment strategy. One of the greatest ways to avoid trouble is to keep it simple. He says the system often gets out of control. So that's, that is a mental model as well, is that if you increase the complexity of a system and a system can also be, you know, an investment strategy or a thought process, um, as you increase the complexity of it, it, it becomes more difficult to understand and you're introducing a lot of risks and a lot of problems. Simplicity has a way of improving performance by enabling, enabling us to better understand what we're doing. And he says we have three baskets for investing. And this is really good. He says, yes, no, and too tough to understand. So if something violates the simplicity principle and he doesn't understand it, he doesn't invest in it. And obviously from looking at his portfolio, we can tell that, um, we can tell that he, he, a lot of, most of his decisions, the vast majority are in the no or the too tough to understand. He very few times does he say yes. Now, he's been very outspoken on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, very serious on this subject. Um, he, he thinks that it is, one of the quotes here, I think I should say modestly that the whole damn development being crypto and Bitcoin is disgusting and contrary to the interests of civilization. Another one in my life, I try to avoid things that are stupid and evil and make me look bad. And Bitcoin does all three. So very outspoken against Bitcoin. Um, now, I, I, I really see eye to eye on a lot of what he says. I think about 95% of what he says is spot on, particularly with the learning, with the developing mental models, with understanding your own biases. He talks a lot about that. So anybody who wants to learn more, you know, go on YouTube and, and listen to some of his, his discussions. He's not as charismatic um, or as funny as Warren Buffett, um, but he, he's a very good speaker. But one of the things I, I did come across was an article from Reuters in June of 2021, where he was talking about um, the communist government of China's policy um, in with respect to Jack Ma and, and 
uh, essentially the disappearance of Jack Ma. So he made some statements there where he basically said that the um, he thought that the communists um, got it right, that they basically called Ma up, um, said, you're not doing this, Sonny. And he, he thought that was great. Another comment about how, you know, he wouldn't take most things from um, the, the communist government, but he really likes the way they run their financial system. You know, I, I think that those comments, I, I'll go as far as to say that they're that they're that they're somewhat ignorant comments. I disagree with them. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, in terms of he was talking about Ant Financial and Jack Ma's company and how, you know, he felt that that encouraged speculation. Um, and he thinks that that should be clamped down on. You know, I, I, I can't comment as to the extent that Ant, everything that Ant Financial was doing and the products that they were offering. But I don't necessarily think that some speculation is a bad thing. I mean, not everybody can be a fundamental investor. Not everybody can be a value investor. I think the market works when you have different types of investors with different time horizons, with different outlooks and different approaches to investing. Um, but then also just the comments about, you know, they, they call them in and they said, you're not doing this, buddy. I didn't like that because it just, I don't think that it was likely an accurate description of what happened. I mean, here you had somebody who was very much in the public eye and that he made a criticism um, and then he disappeared. So I didn't like those comments, but overall, I really enjoyed researching Charlie Munger. And like I said, about 98% of what I, I read that he, that he said or talked about, I really agreed with.